So, why Guru Ji ka Khalsa, why Guru Ji ki Fateh, um, Ravi and uh, Suzanne, thank you, thank you so much for joining us on behalf of Khalsa Aid for our first ever summer series. Um, the pandemic has given us opportunity. I think we lost you there. Okay, can you hear me now? Susan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, can you all hear me? I can hear you yeah. now, yeah. Okay, perfect. And of course, we will have some technical difficulties um, being in a virtual world and everyone's online right now. But as I was saying, with the pandemic, we've had the opportunity to think outside of the box in ways of how do we collaborate and highlight a lot of the other issues our community, our month is either facing or should be thinking more about or paying more attention to. And going virtual with this uh, summer series for all ages was one idea that we had. Um, on how we can do that since we as a Sangat are not able to meet in person as often as we would like and be able to share and really connect. So this is an opportunity to do that. So firstly, again, Ravi and Suzanne, on behalf of the entire team of the Sikh Coalition, we are huge fans and we are very excited to have you both here to talk about Khalsa AIDS work internationally and here in the United States. And thank you again for um, kicking off our summer series. So, um, and for being up a little late on uh, as far as time zones go. So again, thank you. And for all of those who are tuning in, um, uh, my name is Sajid Gore. I am the executive director of the Sikh Coalition. And on behalf of our entire team, very grateful for all of you who have registered for the summer series or attending this one in particular um, and attending others uh, throughout the week. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, 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 thoughts. Um, is one, this is a webinar. So um, just because we have a growing list of people who have registered and are attending this, um, you will only be seeing um, the three of us uh, throughout this conversation, but please do drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, for this series in particular, we are also uh, streaming this live on Facebook. So if anyone has missed it um, or you really enjoy it, please do share that as well. And um, summer series registration for the rest of the week is open. We have about 35 plus sessions. Um, you can just go to sickcoalition.org backslash summer series and um, register for any of our other sessions. Um, so again, Ravi and Suzanne, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, so yeah, I just wanna give a very, very quick brief um, intros though neither of you or Khalsa Aid really needs any introduction. Um, the whole world is always in awe of the incredible and enormous undertaking that Khalsa Aid has taken to make sure that um, we are taking the spirit of uh, Seva in Tsuki and making sure that we are helping and standing up for others. Um, and Khalsa Aid has really taken on that responsibility and lead by example um, for the entire community. And so, and have uh, broadened their work, not just outside of England and internationally. We know that you have gone um, to whether it's places like India, Iraq, um, the border of Syria, you've been everywhere, but are also now doing more and more work here in the United States. So um, Ravi, um, as a founder, um, I'd love to start with you a little bit just to understand your journey and what um, spark the intention to start Khalsa Aid, and then Suzanne, I um, will get into how you joined. Okay. Uh, Khalsa, um, I think uh, most people have been following the story in the beginning of Khalsa Aid. Generally, in the 1999, there wasn't any cross-border humanitarian organization of the Sikh community, you know, it's amazing. We're such a wonderfully generous people, even though we suffered genocides, persecution, we suffered so much, but we never stopped giving. Our Gurdwara is open to all, uh, any faith. Uh, we welcome uh, everyone equally as fellow human beings. Yet on a global level, we were really not doing much. So in 1999, when there was a war in Europe, and a lot of refugees from Kosovo were leaving for Albania. And we were celebrating 300 years of the Khalsa. And I myself have been very connected with Punjab, the events after 84, build up to 84 and after the human rights angle. And I remember very clearly my friends, my family, 
I lost uh, members of my, my cousins or uh, relatives uh, to the state's forms of violence. And um, instead of living in hate, and we wanted to basically show the world that Khalsa didn't mean terror, terrorists or anything negative. Khalsa meant we're the ultimate humanitarian that no matter what the governments or, or um, you know, official authorities do to us, we don't blame people for the actions of the few uh, politicians, etc. So we've uh, wanted to bring the word Khalsa, the concept, to the world. We could have called it CK, we could have called it anything. There was no other organization like it. Mm -hmm. So celebrating 70 years of Khalsa, refugees starving uh, in about 1,500 miles away from London, and we're celebrating, we're planning to celebrate 300 years and uh, Nagar Kirtan again, which for the non-Sikhs is a street procession. Um, you know, um, it's a holy, you know, you know they're very like um, a religiously inspired event mm -hmm. where there's abundance of food, free food, langar, community kit. And uh, yet we were feeding those who didn't need the food. Uh, we were feeding those who didn't really didn't understand the concept, what is Langar is more than free food. It's not just free food. It's like a whole community orientated concept where it's all about equality for all. And so we thought, why don't we take this concept to the refugees where it's needed? So it was the first step. Uh, and it was a tough step. We, we know it was driving from here through Europe to Albania, crossing a couple of seas. We had a lot of races on the way. We learned a lot. And uh, from there, 21 years ago to here, the journey continues. But I think what really set me off in 1999 to say this is what we're going to do, this isn't a one-off, was the generosity of the community. They never once said the refugees are Muslim, we're not going to donate. People were very generously donating, absolutely generously. Our first, first donation actually came from a Muslim guy who owned the shop. He just opened his till in the morning on a Sunday empty this till into a bucket. Um, so it gave us a lot of hope and encouragement. I think that's the key is hope that, you know, you're not alone. And that's what we need when we're down and out. And that's what we can offer as Sikhs to the world. That's what we continually offer in, in the Gurdwara as a hope that nobody's alone. Nobody will go hungry. So, yeah, so that's the beginning of Khal Saeed, uh, taking the message of our gurus inspired by, you know, individuals like Pai Yaji and Sarvata Palavan Ke Shakana, which means share with everyone, well-being of all. Instead of just talking about it and telling people how wonderful we are, we just took that message practically to the world. And um, yeah, so it's been 21 years of that, of that journey and the passion is still the same. I mean, absolutely 100%, right? How do we think about what Lunger actually means and are we doing justice to the concept and thinking about equality, thinking about Van Shakna. And I think this is why Khal Saeed has been so inspiring, right? That you are thinking about how do we do justice to the, the concept and what was required of us and what is continuously required of us. Um, um, as the well, I, asked. Sorry to interrupt you. I think there's, um, yeah. in Lunger, in today's world, Lunger, it hasn't changed the concept and you know when you see these far-right groups which makes me very sad when fellow Sikhs join the far-right rhetoric against refugees right mm -hmm. you know when they say refugees we shouldn't help them you know they are this they are that they fall into this horrible propaganda against refugees from right-wing groups from say India or America or UK or whatever Europe but you got to put yourself in in that time when Guru Nanak Dev was here, when he started Langar, did he say you can all come and accept refugees? So th this is Langar is a uniting force, and it's somebody that something that brings humanity. You cannot be right wing, fascist, and be a Sikh, because that's what Guru's never said. That Guru's never said you can come into a Langar, but not a Iraqi or Syrian refugee. We need to reflect on that. I am so glad you said it and said it so clearly. Um, and I, I think this is one of the things that has always been inspiring about Khal Saeed, that you um, uh, do not think twice about 
how to respond to this idea that langar isn't for everyone. It is absolutely for everyone. Um, and Siki has taught us that we should never, ever think about discriminating against anyone. And you, you, Kalsa, the entire team has been um, very clear about that. And again, has led by example there. So Kalsa, it started in 1992. Um, uh, it's about 30 years almost. Uh, Nin mm -hmm. 99. No, sorry, 1999. Um, so still, so, uh, <laughs> um, we're, uh, we're over two decades. Um, how do you get the inspiration to keep continuing and to keep turning on? Because it is a lot. I might think, uh, you know, when you see like um, the suffering doesn't end, disasters, wars, conflicts, and what keeps people like myself inspired is people like yourself. Is the the whole a whole generation has grown up around Khalsa aid mm -hmm. as humanitarians. You know, like so when you say people ask me, "Oh, Khalsa is your biggest achievement?" No, it's not. My biggest achievement, I would say personally, is bringing that tolerance and acceptance into the minds of a whole generation that we can all live together. So my inspirations come from our young dedicated professional volunteers who believe in the vision of humanity and um, you know for instance we've got a trustee now uh, sorry uh, um, operations director now who started with us he was a trustee before he was 10 years old when Carl had started and he remembers in the gurdwara he couldn't understand why these people were going to pack stuff food and take it to a faraway place and now he's one of our you know opera directors of operations um, so we've inspired individuals in a whole, whole generation and that is my inspiration when youngsters get involved from all over the world there's no bigger inspiration than inspiration than seeing youngsters living up to the to the ideology of the gurus of you know Sarvata Pala and not judging especially in these extremely challenging times when there's a great effort to divide us and turn us against other faiths the youngsters are refusing to do that and they're following the humanitarian vision. That's my inspiration. That's incredible. And I, I think that's a perfect segue um, to Suzanne, you as one of those um, who has taken on a, a leadership role at Khalsa Aid. You serve um, as the uh, Iraq coordinator and uh, you know, as a, as a woman who, from what I understand, is not a Sikh, what brought you to Khalsa Aid and to the journey that you've embarked with the organization? So, um, first of all, when I first met a Sikh guy, I never knew that Sikh existed. I never knew about the history, never knew what Sikhs are. And through Khalsa Aid, through the teams and volunteers who were coming to Iraq monthly, um, day by day, I learned a lot about uh, who the Sikhs were, what Khalsa means, what Langer means, which Langer is one of my favorite things. Uh, uh, so at the beginning, it was, I was just a volunteer uh, with Khalsa, but by day, day by day, the way they were serving the refugees and IDPs, it amazed me that they didn't look about like the religion, the background, the race, nothing at all. If the person needed help, Khalsa was there to help. And that was one of the main reason I uh, wanted to join Khalsa Aid for a long time um, that also on the back of our t-shirts he says recognize the whole all human race is one and that's that's one of the things that um, I personally believe in so that was one of the reasons yeah I joined Khalsa Aid. That's yeah, and that's incredible, right? Like you went from not knowing um, anything about Zaki or the community yeah. to being very well aware of these key concepts and then joining in the efforts. Um, and, and discussing your journey and for both of you, right? Can you share a couple of personal moments um, or stories that really highlighted why this work needs to happen and why this work needs to continue? Rabbi, I know you started there, but I'd love to hear some recent accounts as to, um, again, right? Like what are those moments where you're like, absolutely, this work has to continue and it could also inspire and encourage some of the folks listening in. So I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> examples I mean, the recent one is last year on the Iraq and Syrian border uh, you know like um, the Kurdish government and the Kurdish um, security forces know who Karl Said are and when President Trump pulled out the troops in northeast, northeast Syria 
at one day's notice last October, I think it was, tens of thousands yeah. of crossed the border um, from uh, Syria into Iraq. And during the day, it was very hot. During the night, it was very cold. And uh, Susan uh, uh, went to seek permission for a car say, to work on the very sensitive area on the border. And they said to Susan, I think they said, oh, are you, guy, are you with that guy with the beard? And uh, they, Susan said, yeah, yeah you can find, we can, you can work here. They gave us permission to work as the refugees are crossing on the border and coming in. You see this in the movies, but when you're actually on the border, you see children coming up early morning. We'll get there really early morning to make sure Carl said was funding um, hot meals, hot um, like lentil soup in the morning and with working with Barzani Foundation volunteers. And um, kids, women, men, they would come as it's raining. They, you know, you can't imagine a very tough terrain. There's no trees, it's mountainous, unforgiving so cold they'll come in the morning and they're so cold they can't hold the food they can't hold the plates the cutlery they're absolutely frozen they haven't eaten for days and that's just a recent recent example and you're looking at them you're thinking you know like this is the world we live in you know we live in this century these times and these poor guys you know we you know not only they're crossing the border to escape war as soon as they come into the media they'll be hated because the refugees you know, uh, the dehumanization of refugees continues to this day. So it, it just makes, makes you wonder like, you know, like what are we here for? So we don't stop. So it, it's a message to me personally, we cannot stop. As a small organization, we, we make a huge difference by being in places big organizations can't go or, or won't take the risk. So we do do that. And uh, that's just a reason, uh, you know, and I remember just a very quick one. I remember in 2003, I went to Somalia and uh, the chief, the elder chief in the middle of nowhere in a small village, uh, they gave me three gunmen to guard me in a certain area. Um, you can imagine a village middle of absolutely nowhere, bush, bushland like. And the chief's wife came. It's a traditional gesture to put your hand like this on your bosom and go like that. And was, she's an elderly woman. And she said, she said something to me, this is 17, 18 years ago, which I never forget. And she said, you left your mother behind so far. I am your mother here, like a maternal sign. Mm -hmm. So whatever it come to me and I felt really touched. I'm thinking these guys, nothing. And they give me so much love. So yeah, so, you know, there's so many, I could go on forever and ever, but you know, it's, you see the suffering and then you see the love. All the Syrian refugees, the Kurdish guys who crossed the border last year, there was no hate for me. It was like love. It was like a warmest welcome. They were hungry. They were tired. Yet they showed so much humanity towards me, a foreigner, a guy from outside. And uh, you know, normally you get afraid, thinking, "Can I, can I say hello to these people? Will they be offended?" No, it was. It was like a very. It's amazing. You can't walk in a refugee camp without being stopped for a cup of tea or a selfie or a chat, and that's a relationship. That's incredible. So then, yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective from on the ground as well. Um, I would say um, Halsai had has literally brought um, some people's life back to life. Like I remember, just like my uh, mentioned, uh, October last year when uh, Turkey invaded the Syria, a lot of, there was a, more than twenty thousand refugees across the border. And yes, like we mentioned, Langer. We were given linger to or to refugees who were cold and needed food, uh, who hadn't had food for like three days or so. So that's when I like you know the the, the importance of the linger there. Um, but I remember we had a um, water issue in the camp. There was no water in the camp, and we had to get uh, bring uh, six water trucks to the uh, camp and get water to. And then one day, at, it was like very late. We were just picking up uh, Ravi from the airport right away. He was like, take me to the, uh, to the camp. I want to see the uh, project. Uh, it was late. It was around 8, 8 to 9 p.m. So we went to, we were looking at our uh, water project. And this was this lady walking down uh, uh, the camp. And she was pregnant. She was nine months pregnant. And she needed a C-section uh, surgery. And um, there was no organization that helped her to do the uh, surgery. And if she didn't have the C-section, she would have lost the baby. Um, so she was like, she didn't know where I was. Because of Ravi's beard and turban, I would say, she's like, 
are you guys working here? Are you guys at our job? Mm. We were like, yes. She was like, she started telling her story. She was like, I've been asking everybody. Uh, nobody's willing to help me. Uh, can you guys help us? And right away, we went to their house, gave us a really nice tea. And then uh, next day, we was like, okay, we have to take her to the hospital. We took her to the hospital. The, the doctor was like, okay, tomorrow after tomorrow, we have to do a surgery for her. Otherwise, we're losing the baby. And then we, uh, it was a Christmas, remember? Um, then, uh, so they were calling uh, Ravi, uh, Baba. Uh, they were calling him <laughs> the Christmas. <laughs> Baba Noel, which is, uh, <laughs> um, so... We went the other two days. We went to uh, surgery. She did her surgery. She got a very healthy baby, and uh, they named her Suzanne. <laughs> yeah. Because they were so yeah, they were so grateful that we found her in that situation and we were, helped her right away while she was asking for help for more than a week. So these are the moments where um, people where people don't know where to turn, but when they find Halsaid, Halsaid, like I said, Halsaid is ready to help whoever is in need. So that story to me, it's one of the, yeah, really touching and remembering. Yeah, I, I can imagine why, absolutely. Um, and I can also imagine these are the moments, right, that also push you when it's really dark to keep going. Um, yeah, whether it's the definitely. nickname or having a really cute baby named after you. I know. <laughs> 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 That's incredible. Um, yeah. So along those lines, we've actually gotten a couple of questions from the attendees um, um, just around thinking about uh, how you decide where you're going to go um, to provide support. How do you navigate governments and how do you manage volunteer safety? Yeah, uh, like for instance, again, we'll give you an example of uh, Iraq, which is um, during 2014 when we first started it was uh, notorious for ISIS uh, beheadings, journalists, beheading aid workers. 2014, when all the organizations were pulling out, you know, we were going in. So the first year in Iraq, only I went. It was too dangerous. And then uh, we built a team there. And uh, talking about how to do safety for the volunteers. So we have, uh, we give full hostile training courses, which are like three days residential courses uh, by ex-forces on surviving dealing with difficult situations, but uh, nothing prepares you more than uh, on the ground experience. So in these war zones, we only send the most experienced matures or like uh, uh, volunteers or team team members. We won't send anybody new to mm. such a place or without the hostile training course anymore. And then on the, when you're actually, I think there's a lot of logistics that go behind it. So, for instance, when I went in 2014, uh, I, I didn't know anybody. I just, on the internet, it's word of mouth. So somebody could just sell you out to ISIS because we're working about five minutes from the border. And, uh, you know, if you took the wrong turn, you were a great prize for propaganda purposes. So now for the refugee, for the, for the volunteers, we fill forms in where they're going to be staying, which hotel, their movements. They got to report very, very regularly uh, who they're hanging with. And also their safety when they die now, they can't go uh, alone to so-and-so place. So we follow, uh, we take the safety of the volunteers very seriously. In the old days, when mostly it was myself going, there was no risk assessment. We just go in, do the job now as we grow into a big organization. Yeah. A great big responsibility. And that is one of them is risk assessment and safety. And, and navigating with governments, we don't really tend to work with any you know, government official agencies unless we get asked for support, which we do nowadays with the Kurdish okay. government. They ask us to work in certain areas to support certain refugees. Uh, so we, so Susan will go to a meeting and they will say, can Carlside help 600 refugees here? Can they help a thousand refugees here? And uh, we don't get any protection. You know, We don't get any gunmen or cards or whatever. What we do get at times from the Kurdish government is maybe a letter to say we can work in a particular area, which is restrictive area. So, uh, um, you know, when people sometimes ask me the toughest place to work in the world, and for me, that's in Punjab, uh, in India, which because we, we're treated like, like some sort of like threat to the country. But other parts of the world, we can deal with even a situation around working around ISIS um, uh, occupied area, which are like 35, 40 kilometers away. But working on your own, uh, homeland in a way is the most dangerous because you don't know what will happen next. So that has its own, uh, you know, uh, risks. 
but yeah, everything is taken now. Everything is measured. We don't send someone blindly into anything, including in Africa. It's the same. Now with the coronavirus, everything is stopped. Nobody's flying up from the UK. We're working with local organizations and individuals like uh, Susan. Understood. And yeah, if we could just actually go into a little bit of, um, so you've decided that there's a location that needs need, uh, that there is a need, right? Whether it is um, a, a natural disaster or some sort of uh, crimes against humanity war or something like that. What is the process of Khalsa A determining what resources are going, how you're going to set up resources? Like is Lunger packaged? Is Lunger made on the spot? Like how, how does those operations, if you could just walk us through that outline. Um, every disaster has a different uh, response. Uh, yep. When we sent a team 2017 to Bangladesh during the Rangu, Rangu refugees from India led by, by Amarpreet Singh, uh, two of them went and they set up uh, after a day or two of assessment, they set up a hot langar, hot meals langar for about uh, five to 10,000. And then they called more members from India and employed local people. We bought all the utensils. We're, ser we're serving between 30, 35, 000 people a day on hot meals, which uh, other people are coming to eat or we were packing it up and going on trucks and delivering on the roadside where the refugees are stranded. And in uh, Iraq, the Yazidi IDPs, the Yazidis are the oldest religion uh, in the region in the world, maybe 7,000 year old religion. And uh, ISIS attacked them. There's a genocide committed by ISIS on the Yazidis. And uh, so what we start giving the Yazidis is a dry lunger, like a ration packs. So pasta, pasta sauce, right? Like a huge pack, which will last them for a few weeks. And that's like, um, they can cook it on their own because they have facilities. And uh, we didn't never, in, in Iraq, we didn't really need to do hot meals. And then we can talk about now uh, operations in uh, even in Kerala, the floods, not long ago, I think the last year, year before. And that was again, hot meals as well. People in a disaster area, like a natural disaster more so than a war, I think people really need a hot meal. And nothing beats, uh, even if it's one hot meal, uh, even in the UK when there's floods, um, power was out, there's no cooking. And we're working in very, very nice areas were hit by floods. And we're giving one hot meal, the Punjabi meal. And even, you know, the English people about typing, this is the best thing ever. That hot meal lifted us. So a one a hot meal really does lift people when, you know, when you're down and out. is an earthquake or some other natural disaster and you can't cook for yourselves. So where we can, we try to provide hot meals. How do we identify projects quickly? Again, like in Iraq. In Iraq, there are official camps which are run by big organizations, then they're unofficial camps. Mm -hmm. So as an organization, we work with locals, like uh, uh, Susan used to be with the organization called Wadi and Jinda. So we work with them saying, okay, where can we uh, help? And they would say, okay, by the river, uh, on the embankment, there are 20 people, 20 families, by so and so, there are 30 families, nobody's giving them help because they're unofficial camps. They were scattered all over thousands of people. So we made it our priority that we will focus on those who are not being reached by the big organization. So as a, a very uh, fluid organization, we make decisions mm -hmm. that we don't need a red tape, that we can identify the need and work. The, the whole secret of all this is to work with the locals who have the passion, they have the manpower, and you got the fun. So it becomes a teamwork. And Suzanne, on the flip side, right, as um, the local organization or in your role previously around that or as a coordinator, what are the quick things that you are asking for um, and, and walking through and how do you course correct, right? Because I'm sure that happens quite a bit where it's like, okay, this was the need, um, but the need has now changed quickly or there's an urgent situation and how do you manage that as far as communications and operations go? Um, so as I already mentioned at the beginning in 2014, uh, there was barely shelters, there were barely anybody getting any food puzzles and stuff like that. So that was our very, where our first uh, um, projects. We were giving food packs, shelters, blankets, and these kind of stuff. Um, but now after like a couple of years passed, we uh, slowly, slowly shifted to giving courses, um, giving sewing machines to the ladies, giving them business. We opened a couple of shops for a couple of people, we gave them sewing machines. We were giving them monthly uh, fabric where they work and you know set up their own business um 
we started doing the um, some of the uh, um, kids were coming back from ISIS. They we had to do sur some surgeries for them. So basically, it it turns uh, or I would say it changed uh, by the time where you see what is most needed. Mm -hmm. We're still doing the food puzzles because there's still people living outside of the camp which are not being. Uh, assisted by the big organizations, so organizations like Hulsa Aid are helping these people who are living outside of uh, the camps because they're not registered anywhere else. Um, so yeah, it changed. Basically, it changed. We we as Hulsa Aid, we listen to people a lot. We listen to them. We go. We don't just deliver and that's it. We go listen to them. What is their suffering? What they need? What is uh, um, what they actually need in their life? So um, that's how we change by listening to people as well. Yeah, so it really sounds like there is a reactive that gets you there and you're responding to that, but then it's the long term. How do you ensure that you're, I mean, to some of it, it, it is Band-Aid solutions, right? Because you are providing that reactive care, but then it's about really how do you start addressing the long term needs um, and providing that care is what I'm hearing. So yeah, that's incredible. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that we've gotten um, from individuals so that we're taking some of those questions. Um, somebody asked, how do you train up volunteers before sending them? What does that process look like? So I know, Ravi, you mentioned that in some of the more challenging zones, you're sending um, those who have been around the block quite a few times. But even if it's um, a, new, a new volunteer, what does that really look like? So basically, we got... Um call site in Canada and Australia and America, UK. Mm -hmm. So you go to the call site, USA, uh, Facebook or Instagram page or Twitter page, you can get in touch with the team. So uh, recently, since the last three, four months, our teams have been delivering, uh, especially Canada, America, uh, food parcels, not only to the food pantries, the banks, whatever, uh, food banks, but also uh, to individuals, to international students and those who are in need. So, uh, and doing longer seva. So if, you, if you're interested in joining us, email or contact our, basically our, through our social media, our team, they'll ask you to get involved locally in, in SEVA. So there might be a group, a call side, <coughs> Langer Aid group, or call side, Langer, or other community project that they can get involved. So they'll work three to four months uh, with our local teams, coordinators. We'll get to know you, you'll get to know us. And from there, the first step can be or going on a, a, a mission, aid mission after a few months. But we, we just need to get to know the individual because sometimes, you know, if you push someone in a hurry, we don't know what their beliefs are, what, you know, what they, how they behave under pressure, how they deal with vulnerable people, their temperament, uh, all sorts of stuff. We need to get to know you for several months. And to get involved, like, as I said, go contact Carl said USA, if you're from the USA or Canada, through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and they will reply to you. Super helpful. Um, so again, for folks that are listening in, please um, reach out to Call Said on social media or on their website um, so that you can start volunteering locally and then build your way up to potentially going on a mission as well, if that is your intent. Um, and it sounds like there are a couple of folks that are asking where there may not be a Khalsa Aid local chapter. Um, is that still a possibility for them to be able to support locally? Yeah, well, if you ask um, our team in America, they will then guide you. Maybe yeah. it all starts, you know, if there is a place that we don't have a chapter and somebody wants to help open a chapter, they will talk to you and they will help you set that up. So it's not, it's not like, say, for instance, uh, I'm not saying there isn't. If there's, if there's one in, say, Chicago and you want to get involved, you can say, hi, I can help with setting up a, a, a call set in Chicago and then they can talk to you to help you with that. So we understand there will be some isolated places where there isn't a call set chapter, but then our team can work with you to set one up. Great. And is there an age requirement? Normally, uh, if you're going to run a chapter, you're going to be over 18 uh, for insurance and other purposes. Uh, and then um, if you're volunteering, you can be younger if you're accompanied by an adult, if you're helping with food. Then if you're younger than, I think, 16, you need to be uh, with some adult to be advised during that uh, voluntary time. Yeah, uh, that's great. And I will also add, because I think it is important, um, uh, all organizations require both uh, human resources, so people power, um, but also require uh, this month. 
and require the money power um, to do the work. So uh, volunteer with both your time and your resources financially. Um, so I would encourage everyone um, on that as well. All right, and then just, uh, I, I think shifting gears a little bit um, to better understand, um, you know, now that you've spent a lot of time, about two decades doing this work, you've really seen the challenges that community face around poverty, around hunger. What are some of the solutions? I want to get into a, a bit about the long-term solutions. So whether it's call aid, whether it's individuals, whether it's communities at larger governments, um, Robin and Suzanne, what are some solutions that you really see that we need to start implementing? Um, it doesn't need to be cost aid specific, but we need to start implementing to eradicate um, hunger and poverty. I think uh, we'll agree as well that the biggest challenge we all face, all organizations, is corruption. Uh, corruption at every level. You know, when you're working from another country in a different country, different culture, uh, you need to give backhanders or they want backhanders. We don't agree with that. We don't agree uh, giving uh, money to anybody, any third party, uh, or they will make it difficult. I think long term depends on political stability of the region or the country. Uh, for instance, you know, like in um, Haiti, 2010 earthquake, uh, we wanted not just give food, we wanted to help with the long term water solutions. So we put water pumps in so many orphanages that when the fighters uh, hit by a UN worker, they locked down this orphanage and then the water pump in the orphanage saved their lives. So, but then the corruption at local level is so bad that, you know, we couldn't send any food or containers or anything from abroad because you, you lose them. And it's the same working in uh, other parts of the world. It's corruption is our main issues, political, uh, uh, political uh, uh, challenges, when you know conflict, like in uh, Iraq, in the Kurdistan, we're working with Sudanese. Uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, Kurdish people voted for independence in a referendum, and Baghdad, Turkey, Iran, they all blockaded the region, and basically almost starved them to death. And we couldn't even go in either. So whatever we were doing, we were stuck too. So uh, it's very difficult. We liked on long-term solution. We like to do something where we can fight hunger. We can create opportunities to help people with businesses like we're doing in uh, Iraq to the ZD girls with uh, sewing machines, fabric, helping, whatever. If you can buy plots of land to do something, we can, but it's not easy. So setting up businesses, uh, microfinance, that would be the ultimate goal for Carl Said, uh, assisting people to pick themselves up. Having a, still, you know, we are, uh, generically, we are emergency a organization but we're moving towards like in africa we're doing water for africa project in malawi and Zambia, putting water pumps we solar power water pumps sustainable energy uh getting away from the fossil fuels but it's not easy because then the locals you know when you put a solar power somewhere saying okay it's gonna get stolen it's gonna get stolen it'll be stolen the next day or something uh so we're working with so many challenges but the main challenge is corruption yes so we like to do more sustainable projects which we are we're launching we're doing already more agricultural especially uh towards punjab way because there's so many insecticides etc uh being used at the moment we want to try and educate the people on that sort of stuff but it won't be easy because working with those governments they don't make it easy they see you they see you as a threat instead of a, a support base susan um, I cannot hear. Uh, yeah, Susan, sorry, okay. I just, <laughs> yeah, Susan, if you can share what your ideas would be as well, that's really helpful and insightful, Ravi. Um, I agree with everything what Ravi just said, uh, but yeah, as as a part of like long-term uh, solutions that we're doing in Iraq here, as uh, like uh, Ravi mentioned, we're um, giving businesses to these people and that not just helping them to bring an income to the family, but psychologically it helps them a lot. And um, for us, one of the biggest issue here that we are facing with refugees and IDPs is just um, uh, is uh, psychosocial uh, problems. And uh, setting up these kind of business, uh, providing them a, a, a source of life, is also helping them up with psychosocial uh, problems. And um, um, by giving, setting up their own shops uh, or um, 
also we're looking at to do some agriculture support as well because here um, Yazidi people are really really um, uh, clever and talented with uh, their agriculture mm -hmm. uh, skills as well um, so by providing that um, also will help them um, as long, long, uh, long term as now they are returning back uh, to Shingon um, we'll be helping them out hopefully in Shingon maybe uh, now we have some security issues that we cannot be operating there, but hopefully in the near future we can. Um, so I think for us to look at long-term help would be to shift our work more to where they're going to be living for the rest of their life, which is Shingon. So I think looking at there, um, we, we can set up more uh, long-term projects there than here uh, in Doho, where of course people are, can do come but leave again. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really um, incredible. And we did get one specific question. Um, I know, Ravi, you had raised Punjab earlier, but what specifically can um, be done to rehabilitate Punjab and to improve the situation there? And like you said, right, Punjab seems to be very difficult. What makes Punjab so difficult as far as the aid that you provide um, there? <clears throat> well, one is the government regulations, which are very, very tight for international NGOs working in the region, you know, basically you're being watched. Uh, as I said before, you, you're treated as a threat. So when I go to Punjab, I'm seen like a, some sort of negative force. And, um, you know, like, uh, and also within our community, there's so much jealousy as well, pulling each other down because we won't work with certain groups or we won't fund certain individuals. So and so, so our own community sometimes, sometimes can be our own worst enemy. So. In Punjab, we got a big project. You know, we're helping families, 203 families of 84 who were left on their own, the elderly folks. Uh, that's a lot of families every month. We're still doing blood support from last year. This year is continuing again. We built a school. We've uh, run tuition centers now. We've got a hospital in Jammu and Kashmir. We're funding about fifteen twenty thousand dollars minimum a month on medical care, if not more, every month. But the problem is. Uh, sending funds, working openly uh, to say, for instance, you want to open a hospital or something, that would be a nightmare. And then if you want to build something in Punjab, you got to give backhanders or work with politicians. And when politicians change, the political party changes, and they bring their own, because uh, the police is politicized too. So whoever is in charge of the state owns the police. And so whatever they want to do, they can harass you. There's open harassment for Many of, of Western NGOs work, you know, they work very, um, how can I say, very uh, like walking on eggshells that, you know, we're not going to be targeted for the wrong reasons. Uh, investment wise, uh, it's uh, unstable for us to invest heavy funds in local banks because we, again, we don't know if they freeze our accounts or not. They're frozen, they're frozen Greenpeace. Uh, Indian agencies have frozen Greenpeace a few years back because. Oh woke up for the tribals uh, in southern India. Uh, but generally, it's the way we're treated. I think all foreign years probably relate to the same, that we are treated very suspiciously, but other parts of the world, we're welcomed. Mm -hmm. In our own state or, or within India, we get treated like very, especially if you raise the plight of human rights, then you're basically an enemy of the state. So and I talk about human rights all the time. Yeah. And, looked at and done with very favor, but even those who don't, they find it difficult to work there. So sometimes when you're challenging organizations, like not just cars, it's other organizations working there. Why did you do this? Why did you delay this or so and so? Because it's not easy. It's not just cars, it's others too also. It's very, very difficult. It's easy to say, go and do this, go and do that in Punjab. Go and you, you, it's very difficult to send funds, to work with people who are trustworthy, to, to operate smoothly it's not easy like i said it's not just Carl Said, it's everyone else so if you're always condemning people doing something takes longer in punjab then you need to rethink you know why are we able to take say a hundred thousand cash today if i want to take it today into iraq there will be no issues but i can't even take a thousand dollars or two thousand pounds and if i had to declare it what it's for it's for charity work you see the amount of paperwork you fill in india so there are a lot of difficulties yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot through work work through. Um, what are a couple of ideas that you would have as far as suggestions go? Again, whether it's Kalsay that 
does this or anybody else as to how can we ease those tensions or those challenges in Punjab? I think what's saving Punjab and many other, many villages is not the organization. I think sometimes you look at organizations saying, why are they doing great work? Which they are. We're all trying to do something. Yeah, absolutely. Individuals who could be your uncle, could be your, uh, your relative, could be your neighbor who's helping a few children in your, in your village, or they're running a school in your village, or they're running a hospital, or they're doing eye clinics. It's individuals that are so far saving Punjab who are doing mm. all these acts of kindness across the state. So I think also, eventually, you know, we will have to work. You know, there's no way if I want to spend a, a million pounds on a project in Punjab, you have to work with the government. You know, sometimes you know, people want me to, the chief minister or something, you know, you may not like their policies, but then if you want to work in the state, you're going to have to meet that person and say, we're going to do this. Uh, we need your support. Basically, what we're saying is just keep it our way. Let us do the work. If you're not happy, ask us. But what uh, problems arise is at the lower level when people then say, you want to do you want to do this here, you have to work through me. If you don't work through me, then you know, so you can't work. They need a backhander. It's a whole system's corrupt. So the bigger the investment, the higher level you got to work at. So, you know, if we have to meet the chief minister who may not be liked by many people, but, you know, because at the end of the day, he's running the show there. Yeah. We work without uh, the, those projects. So, but we, like I said, we're continuing to do it. We've got a cause at India team. They're doing an amazing job, Amarpreet Singh, Amar Singh, Amar Singh and co. So now they're getting funding from within India as well, which makes it easier. If they're, if they're fundraising in India, no problem, but they can't fundraise. Right? A lot of people are donating and they're doing projects. It's a, it's a long haul. It's not, it's not something short term. Punjab isn't easy to work. But when you're saying to people, how come you didn't do this? How come? Like, look at us. You know, we're still there. We done it last year. We're doing it now. I think we're the only organisation to show exactly how much was collected in the Punjab floods, and we still got that total what we're spending, how much we're spending. We didn't hide the money away. Many mm -hmm. organisations didn't show how much they collected. We actually showed every penny. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not easy. We can't just spend a million pound. I can spend a million pound in Iraq in the next few days. I can't do it in Punjab. Yeah. I, I think a couple of things that you have said just again highlight the the power of one, the individual, about whether it is volunteering, going out, setting up projects, getting involved with Khalsa Aid, um, providing financial resources, but also that um, one individual, right, when there's... Uh, you know, in Sikhi, we're taught that we're supposed to remove ego, anger, right? Um, uh, the five vices. So when, as we're thinking about that, that also creates a lot of hurdles. Um, those one, that one moment, that one exchange can create a lot of hurdles for projects. And I, I think as a reminder to us all, um, when we are uh, engaging in um, seva and in volunteer work to remember like what is our responsibility to these projects and making sure that they continue and how do we both proactively do more, but also make sure that we're not getting in the way of projects happening as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, um, we, we got a question about this, you get um, unwarranted pushback, uh, criticism, and then how do you just handle that, um, you know, at the organizational level, but also with volunteers? You know, I mean, if somebody in my position cannot take constructive criticism, then there's a problem. I openly welcome constructive criticism. Uh, what we got, what we got in the community is uh, jealousy, which is you can't really, you know, challenge or do anything about, because it's not like uh, there's not even a question. It's the way you ask a question. You'll get these people who want to be, you know, fly by night heroes, want to engage or everything. You will give me an answer now. Where did this money go? You will tell me now, or else. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not going to engage with you. We get people. We got people all the time coming and going. They ask us questions, we've got nothing to hide. It's just a mentality that how can, you know, what I've seen in the last 21 years being the first Sikh organization to work cross-border and then many of them come in, which is great news, the more the merrier, is that there are those, some, some of those who think you launch an organization that to get 
to a different level, they have to step on other people. They got to bury the other people to, to be successful. And that's hence why they're not successful. You know, if you stop focusing on others, what they're not doing, but, you know, focus on what you're supposed to be doing, you will succeed. So, uh, you know, I, I, we got a lot of these, every year we got these huge hate campaigns inspired by individuals or different organizations within our community, not from outside. You know, Indian government, like I said, all paperwork restrictions, you know, they're the hate you, you don't ask mm -hmm. them, but our community will try to bring you down, which is the downside of our community. They are very generous, but if they're not the general people, it's either inspired by other organizations or, or groups who feel either Ravi Singh wants to be famous, political, or has a motive to, 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 to seek political power, or they feel like the popular. Tapping on someone, so we, I, you know, it's it's been a personal journey where we have so many hate campaigns against the family, against the kids, very vicious ones, personal attacks, and uh, but they all fallen. We're still standing, we're still here because we don't, we don't complain, wind your moan. We just get on with our own uh, uh, focus on our own. Uh, yeah, gotta carry that work forward. Vision. Gotta carry. Gotta but, carry. But I will say to you, anyone, if you want to know what, it, what, what it's like to work in the community, if you want to know what it's like, <clears throat> what the community or in this, and some of the community, not all of you, all of you very, very generous, very wonderful, get into Seva and you'll soon find out about politics in the community. But don't let that put you off. If you're a volunteer, I respect you. I don't care who you volunteer with. You can volunteer with 10, 100, 1,000, 10 million organizations you you what you are you're a diamond without you organizations cannot function so i really i have the highest respect for volunteers if somebody at the top if if somebody at if somebody at the top is uh spreading poison that's up to them but volunteers we have to admire every single volunteer uh, even a volunteer will tell me some volunteer tell me no i'm not happy about this we're not happy okay we listen we said okay i think you can do it better but you know, we, oh, I personally will welcome uh, uh, constructive criticism because that makes us grow and get better. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Ravuji. We um, have to have integrity, and what I've noticed in um, most of others in the community, even though it can be very challenging at times um, to. Uh, you know, walk the path. Um, but when you do so with integrity, with the best of intentions, and to really do it again, where we started from is like, what was the Guru's vision for us, right? What was the Guru's vision for Lunger? What was the Guru's vision um, for the Khalsa? If we do it with that integrity, we, we do it with that intent, and we do it with those values, and we really follow that Gurmat mindset, um, we can be in a position to do a lot of good, again, as was intended of the of our army of, of the Khalsa so it is really critical that we do that and um and I encourage every single person that is listening in um to find ways to volunteer um and find ways to further and um help uh progress be opened and be kind um to one another as we all learn right we are all in a journey of learning um I just so we're at the hour um we're gonna go about 10 to 15 more minutes tops. Um, I have one question that I did want to close out with, but we have dozens and dozens of questions that are open and I've been trying to ask as many as I can as we've been going along. Um, so apologies if we don't get to every single question, um, but hopefully something or something along those lines has been answered. Um, where I actually wanted to end, and then we'll get into a couple more um, questions, is you know, Kalsa Aid has grown tremendously over these last twenty plus years. Um, if uh, Ravi Sazan, if you can just touch about like again, what is the size of the organization right now, and what are the plans for the next ten to twenty years? Um, you know, somebody actually asks, is there an intent to start a medical arm of the organization? So, like, if you can just talk about where we currently are as far as size of budget, project staff, and what's the vision for the next 10 to 20 years? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we have now branches in uh, um, Australia, Canada, America, UK, and setting up in Europe. 
um, and um, you know, as as the support bases, there are so many places that they're asking us to set up bases. We've now grown uh, our team uh, at headquarters in London. Uh, we just got to move to our small office building, and uh, we got now an operations director. We got operations manager. We got a lot of new positions coming in now to support that growth because uh, without having uh, 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 the staffing level to manage even in America and Canada, it's only a matter of time now when we start employing people uh, to run projects and uh, country uh, uh, projects within those countries. So the vision basically is to continue to grow but <clears throat> not lose that, that the human, that personal touch. Uh, I think the, the sad part for me is you know, when you're growing, you become more corporate because you have to control the growth. You got more accountable. You got responsibilities. Then you lose that little bit, that personal touch. We're always trying to have people at higher positions who are even at office in the UK. They've been our volunteers. They've been our trustees. Now they're at the high level running the show because they understand what it's like to be on the ground. We got now branch in Iraq, like you've seen with Susan. We never thought in a million years we'll be working in one of the most volatile areas of the world. So we got people ready to go in that region, any other disasters or war, we got great uh, friendship. But networking wise, we got networking of network of friends <clears throat> all over the world, in Africa, in Europe, uh, even in the places we uh, haven't worked. We got supporters who are just waiting for us to say, okay, uh, carry out this work, like in Peru, for instance, uh, Uganda, uh, just to give, uh, give you an example, South Africa. So we are all over uh, and we'll be strengthening that in the next few years. But it doesn't mean that, you know, if you've seen uh, yourself, we're not aggressive on fundraising. I don't think you even get an email from us. I don't think any of your people listening in today will even receive the email from Carl Zed saying, give us your money, donate to us. We may put the odd post on social media, but we're not very aggressive on, on uh, asking for donations because we show you our work. So the whole idea is now we're working with World Food Program at the UN level. We're trying to work in countries like Yemen, which is difficult. So we're setting up, trying to set up a base in Africa, a very strong base with uh, local organizations. So we, so we want to be in places in the next 10 years in most key places on earth, which are facing uh, environmental changes, climate change, uh, hunger crisis, so we want to be ready in those places to react instead of sending teams from far afield, have that in the next 10 years, set up the bases with the support from the Sangat so that we can respond as we are. We're known for a rapid response and we want to continue doing that. But like you said, everything takes funds and the Sangat continues to donate and we continue to grow um, with staffing, with operations. We're always thinking of a new, opening new, new uh, uh, I think some of the other projects uh, you mentioned, uh, we want to get involved in. But now I'm even looking at child slavery uh, project. Uh, I've been in touch with a couple of organizations in Africa. I need to get to know them, their background next few weeks, maybe months. And then we can see how we can work on uh, child, uh, child slavery. We've already been helping with the women who were enslaved by ISIS. So how can we now, uh, Carl said, be more working with, like somebody said to you about the governments, how can we strengthen our contacts with the governments or local politicians in many countries, especially in Africa and Asia, where you need connections to get something done uh, on a bigger level. Smaller level we've been working, there's not an issue. The level I'm thinking of, you will definitely need to work with, uh, with the governments without uh, being tainted by corruption. But sadly, most are. But so we will work in these challenges, especially in areas facing uh, the changes in climate due to climate. Great. And um, just uh, on that note, right, um, you're saying locally it's been a little bit easier to identify the right individuals and get in touch with volunteers, but just elaborating a little bit more, um, what about larger organizations, whether it's the Red Cross, UN, um, how do those relationships look and um, are, are those relationships growing at this point? Yes, uh, through our work in, um, Susan deals with uh, all the big organizations daily basis in Iraq. Uh, it was actually a UN uh, that weren't very keen in the beginning last year, weren't very uh, ha happy to see us, but then 
uh, I think Susan will explain to you how we how we became the probably more active than then than than the UN. So they know who we are. Again, we don't really go out having coffee meetings or sitting in whatever restaurants. We our work attracts those people to talk to us. So the UN's talking to us in Iraq. You are not talking to to us. Uh, some of the agency WFP World Food Program by Yemen because they've seen the work. So we get approached by many organizations. But now eventually we will need that corporate, the corporate look where we can have someone dealing with these organizations to form partnerships, to maybe reach out the funding, which uh, some of the governments do for aid and development. We never tapped it. All our funding comes from the public, from the general community. We don't get any grants. We don't get any from any government. We are pure NGO. But eventually we'll have to work like the bigger NGOs on grants, et cetera. But that's down the line. It's not at the moment. Yeah, and along those lines, I, I know it's been asked, um, but just to make sure um, for folks that are here in the United States, are donations here in the United States tax deductible? Yes, they are now. Yeah, they got the 501c, I think you call it. 501c3. Yeah, they got all that. Now, so if you go to Carlsa Aid website, www.carlsaid.org, and the donate button, it gives you options around the world where to donate from. Great. And we team Omar Singh in California and Amrit Pal in New York and Harpreet Singh. He's in the background in California as well. And absolutely wonderful volunteers in North America, Canada, America, Australia. And it's the volunteers that make it what it is. But our coordinators, Jitinder Singh in Canada. I've known Jin the day one we started Carlsberg in the UK. He moved there. Omar Singh are known for like about almost 10 years. And Amrit Pal is my niece. And uh, she's into uh, investment banking, but then she said she wants to get involved uh, in uh, Carl's Aid and she's doing a fabulous job. Uh, for yeah, last shout out to her for helping us set this up. <laughs> she did up actually, yeah. <laughs> she did. <laughs> so thank you, Amrit Paul. Without you, this would not have happened. Amrit Paul, Ata, New Jersey. Um, and Suzanne, just um, we'll just we're gonna end it here. But I, I before we end, I would like to hear from both of you um, just some parting words. Um, you know, what is your vision for what the world could be like in the next ten to twenty years? And um, what are your encouraging and inspiring words for um, all of the sevadars that are watching today on what they can take on at home? Go on, Susan. You go ahead first. Oh, okay. You're the big well, boss. <laughs> my message has been the same <clears throat> for many, many years. And the message remains very strong today that when you ask me what's my message to the young, young generation, especially to the Sikhs, especially to the Sikhs, you know, know who you are and don't run away from it. You know, we're here to serve humanity. The whole concept of Khalsa uh, isn't to be inward, you know, we are meant to be outside. We're very distinct. The whole identity we've got, you know, is for a reason. And when I go to Iraq, you see the love, people see the turban, the beard, they, they, there's so much love out there. So I treat my my own turban like the Nishan Sahib in the Gurdwara, the flag. Mm -hmm. It says, hope, humanity. Well you know, when you, when you have that symbol, you carry up hope and humanity. How can you be anything but a humanitarian? So. My message to all the, our generations, especially the Sikhs, is that you are born humanitarians. You know, you, you have the whole concept. You go, Sarabat Tapala, Bandike Shakana. You know, you say it in your Ardas there and you pray for humanity day and night. Yet somehow, you know, we talk about Guru Nanak Dev, you traveling the world, even up to Iraq. But when we want to step into work somewhere, parents say, no, no, don't do that. You can't do this. So you need to challenge your own custodians who kept you away from this seva. Seva starts at home in the community, in the Gurdwara, then the global level. But your tolerance and challenge hate in these very challenging times, you have to challenge hate. You have to speak up for human rights, not just for the Sikhs, for the Yazidis, for whoever they are, the Kurdish around the world who are struggling. If you believe you're a Khalsa, you're a Sikh, you will speak for everyone. Every human rights, every, every human rights abuse uh, around the world is a human rights abuse to us personally and you know humanitarian doesn't mean i get told all the time stick to seva don't talk about this but if you're humanitarian and you don't talk about human rights there's something very wrong with you so be inspired who you are be positive in your thought process and uh, and get away from this right-wing rhetoric and uh, you know serve 
the community, serve humanity. And if there's anything we can do, you want to set up a group and you want to talk to me, talk to your local team to get in touch with me. I can help you with whatever if you want to set your own thing up. Just don't look back. Don't let anybody hold you back. And stay in charity alone. Remember in the days, Sikhs were so prosecuted, we were hiding in jungles and they were still in charity alone. That's your inspiration. We never give up hope and we are the givers of hope. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. And of course, I, I just, I, I think we are all born humanitarians and it's in us. Um, it's just about moving towards action. I think that's incredible. Zen? Yes. Okay. So um, for me, I always, I'm, I'm a young person. I'm only 25 years old. Yeah. Um, when I go on, I would say social media and these stuff, it, it makes me sad to see the whole generation nowadays generation is mostly uh, focus on followers, likes, and not educating themselves. So it makes me very sad to see this. And I want to just like say, I hope, I hope they could um, care less about that kind of stuff and care more about what is going on in the actual world. Um, all these wars going on in other countries. Uh, I really hope that um, the young generation can treat them uh, each other uh, with with kind respect and not look at each other's religious differences. But um, also I would say um, as a woman in the Middle East, I, I really do uh, uh, face a lot of issues as being a woman and working in such a big position, um, which all thanks to Hosaid for, for getting me to this position, which is helping so many other young ladies to, to actually have a hope um, to to work on their dreams and you know get their dreams. So my message to to the parents of the people who are living in Middle East is to support their kids more and to focus on their dreams and to support them to do what what they want. Uh, and uh, yeah, for all the young people out there, uh, at least have small projects. You know, we're young people. We have energy. We have time. Um, so everybody can can do a small project in their neighborhood, helping a neighbor, helping a friend, helping a family member. Um, it starts from small then going bigger. So yeah, just, uh, I would say help each other. Don't look at each other differences and yeah, together we better. I love it. And I love that you are a young female leading. That is really important and very encouraging. I know to many of the young women, um, uh, <coughs> and women of all ages, being female in a male-dominated society, Susan's in a very difficult position. She's actually challenged many norms to lead. And mo most of the time, girls in that region are not allowed to do anything, and she's actually leading organization, which is more commendable, like, like you said. It's, it's very commendable. It's, it's very commendable. It's difficult, um, but it is, it is inspiring. Um, and I know there are several young women who have joined in. I've gotten a couple of texts already. Um, so you are inspiring them. And I would say you're inspiring women of all ages. And I hope you're all, um, the men are also like, yes, um, we need more women leading. And we, um, and it's inspiring to see that um, coming from a woman as well. <coughs> um, so with that, um, again, my apologies for not being able to get to every single question. We've had um, about 50 questions in the Q&A and there was no way in an hour and 15 minute segment we could get to all 50. Um, but I will encourage all of you to reach out to Casa Aid on social media. They're super active um, through their website. Um, we will, of course, follow up with their handles everywhere, their social media handles. Um, and they're very responsive. And if you have any um, final questions that you want to send us, we can definitely send to the team. Um, I'm sure Amit Bal will help us coordinate um, that as well. And we hope that we can continue this conversation with Kalsa Aid and um, set up more platforms like this to open dialogue um, so that more individuals can get to know um, Kalsa Aid's work, our work, our partnerships um, across the board. So again, thank you, Ravi and Suzanne. And thank you for all of those who have stayed on and attended. Um, we hope that you will continue to join us for summer series all week. It's a great lineup. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the Sick Coalition team that has put this together. Again, it's over 35 sessions. We have two sessions a day for younger kids every single morning, afternoon, depending on your time zone, and um, three to four sessions every single afternoon through Saturday um, that range on a variety of topics. 
So again, um, to our participants, Ravi and Suzanne, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Zico. Thank you for having us. Thank Bye. you. All right, Waigurji ka Khalsa, Waigurji ki Fateh.